noches, bienvenidos a Books and Books. Muchas gracias por estar con nosotros aquí para esta presentación muy especial. Tenemos el grandísimo honor de tener con nosotros a Rita Moreno. Don't, you, you were expecting English too? Maybe somebody will speak English as well. Um, she's here uh, with us for the second time esta noche porque acaba de salir la biografía en español. Um, I guess she will be able to speak bilingual as well. We are live stream. Estamos también teniendo el programa en directo, en live stream. Tenemos muchísimos eventos como este todas las noches. We have events like these every single night. If you still haven't given us your email, uh, please do so. Estaremos pasando esto para que nos den su, su email. Tenemos eventos como esos todas las noches. Eh, si tienen un celular, por favor, apáguenlo eh, de una vez. Y bueno, para presentar esta noche a Rita Moreno, to introduce Rita Moreno this night in Spanish, we will have Raquel Roque, um, a bookseller since she was like eight years old. Es, es mi, mi honor presentar a Raquel Roque. Un aplauso, por favor. Ah, perdón. Uh, ven, 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 ven. Al final de la presentación tendremos preguntas y respuestas y como estamos haciendo una transmisión en vivo, pasaremos el micrófono para que nuestros espectadores en casa también puedan escuchar las, las preguntas. At the end of the presentation, we'll have questions and answers and we'll pass the mic around so that people that are watching us at home can also listen to your questions. Thank you so much for being here. Raquel. Thank you. Buenas noches y bienvenidos a Books and Books. Es una ocasión tan especial porque miren a quién tenemos. Y además una ocasión tan linda porque es un programa en español. Gracias Gloria y gracias a Books and Books por tener un gran interés en tener programas, cultura y libros en español. Uh, good evening and welcome to Books and Books. This is a super special occasion, not only because of who we have, Rita Moreno, but it's also one of our programs in Spanish, which we're so proud of, to bringing in the books, the culture, and the programs in Spanish. Nuestra Rita Moreno, y le digo nuestra porque fue la primera diva latina, nos enseñó lo que era ser latina en América. La primera, la primera mujer no solamente ganó un Emmy, un Tony, un Golden Globe, pero un Oscar. Salió con Elvis, amó y se dejó amar por Marlon Brando. La, la vida es como un libro. Cada día es una nueva página. Y creo que así ella escribió su biografía y sus memorias. Yo he tenido el honor y la oportunidad de vender su libro en un almuerzo de jóvenes blogueras latinas. Y déjeme decirle, no había nadie más vigente que Rita Moreno. Con humor único, una personalidad vibrante y pasión contagiosa, se mete a todos en el bolsillo. In a nutshell, I just wanted to say that she is the first Latin diva. She's the one that taught us how to be Latin. She not only won an Emmy, a Globe, but an Oscar. And I had the real distinct pleasure of selling her book in English at uh, Hispanicize. It was a convention of Latin bl bloggers. And there was nobody more into it, more modern, than Rita Moreno. Pero yo como librera, as a bookseller, lo que de verdad admiro es que es autora, por someterse a un régimen, por someterse a una disciplina de escribir un libro, de ser editada, de ser publicada, de hacer repaso de su vida y de trabajar promoviendo su historia, su raza, su inspiración y su libro. Sigue en la lucha. Y como librera también le quiero decir que el libro está buenísimo. Madre, abuela, Latina, actriz, cantante, bailarina y autora, Rita Moreno. Hola, hola, hola. Sí, yo hablo español. Bueno, a veces hablo español, a veces hablo Spanglish. Así es la vida. Okay, I just need to know this. This is for me. Uh, how many people here are Spanish speaking? Arms. Coño. Okay, because I want to read something in English, but I'll, I'm also going to read something in, in Spanish. Okay? Del libro. Let me start with the English part. 
Oh, no, that's the Spanish. Y que me tomé un vino y estoy arrebatada. That's not funny. Okay, this first, this is the very first chapter of the book. And uh, I'm reading it because it gives you a really good idea of something that many of you, and if not many of you, probably your, your, your grandma or your mommy or your uncles and aunts went through in this country when you first came here. It will tell you actually what the book is really all about. I mean, it's Hollywood, it's Marlon Brando, it's Elvis Presley, all that kind of stuff, but it's also my, mi vida, okay? So I'm gonna do this first in English and then I'll read you a little section in Spanish. This is the first chapter and it's called, Hey Boy. Hey boy, I scream. Hey boy. I don't know what I'm saying. I speak only Spanish, just off the boat from San Juan. I am five years old in a hospital ward, and I know that there's another Spanish kid here because I can hear him a few beds away from me. The orderlies are yelling at him, and I parrot what they say. Hey, boy. <laughs> Crying and feverish, I learned my very first words in English from that boy. Shut up, he says to me. Hey, boy, I shout back. Shut up. <laughs> I have always been a quick study, a fast learner, anything to survive. Okay, start back there. New York, 1936. I am not yet named Rita Moreno. I am still Rosita Dolores Alverio. I am five years old. When we leave Puerto Rico, it is as if we are caught in a reversed, reverse Wizard of Oz. We go from brilliant technicolor to gray, grit gray, black and white. The world, for me, that was lush and hot with life. Sunshine, bright flowers, birds, whistling frogs, cookies, turns to lifeless cold ash. After my island, after my island, New York City seems a freezing hell. Later, people ask, hey, so why didn't you uh, and your mother turn back? <laughs> well, we couldn't afford return passage. Most of us spent all the money we had to sail to America and to start a new life with new opportunities. Others had hopes to settle, make a fortune, and then later return to the island. Meanwhile, they worked in New York to send money back to their families in Puerto Rico. Sound familiar? Yeah. It doesn't have to be Puerto Rico, it could be Cuba. When you are five years old, what is money? What is opportunity? My mother and I arrived in winter in New York City, and I thought, this is crazy. What have we done? But my 22-year-old pretty, full-lipped, full-hipped mother had had enough of Juncos Puerto Rico, her unfaithful husband, and her old life, which did not look like paradise to her. My mommy, Rosa Maria Marcano Alberio, was looking for a new start, a new husband. She was seeking love and fortune, and she would walk toward it on her homemade sandals and in her hand-sewn dress, carrying her one suitcase and the rest in shopping bags. When you have almost nothing, when you have almost nothing, you can travel light. My mommy was escaping something. At five, I didn't know what she wanted to escape. But she did not want to live with Paco, my father, anymore. That much I knew. And I never saw her standing close to him or even alone in a room with him. She was in a hurry to get away from him. And in my imagination, or do I see him, his arm reaching out, grabbing her to pull her back to him and her twisting back and saying something to him, something sharp but scared too, like, keep away from me, déjame, no me toques. Don't touch me. The first thing that happened when I came to America was that I got sick, terribly sick. 
burning up, shaking cold, itching like crazy sick all over my body. What am I doing? Five years old, alone. Can't speak English in some awful ward, in some bad New York hospital. No one can understand what I'm saying except the boy who teaches me the words, shut up. What is this place? The hospital's name Misericordia, just to tell you right away how miserable it is. <laughs> how did I get here? I'm dying from terror almost, like the little baby bird that I once picked up that died in my hand. That little baby bird gazed up at me and gave me a look, a look I could never forget. And it was like the little bird was so scared, he just stopped breathing. Little eyes glazed. Well, maybe I am dying of fear, too, before the sickness can get me. I don't even know what's wrong with me. Later, I would found out, find out it was chicken pox. A common, but at that time, very serious childhood disease. But in the moment, I thought the same mysterious force that killed the little bird was attacking me. Now this could not happen in my worst nightmare. Only life can be this terrible. They come for me in the dead of night, masked men who grab me, wrap me in a sheet, una sabana, tie me in all the way and do not even let my head stick out. They twist the ends of the body sack like a Tootsie Roll wrapper and blind in the sack I squirm and I yell for my mother, and my mother screams and cries like only a mother can scream for them to let her go, to let her go with her baby girl to the hospital. Don't take my baby. Let me go with her, Madre de Dios, Mother of God. My mommy, Rosa Maria, she's only 22 years old. She runs down the five flights of stairs alongside the ambulance attendants. We hit every corner of every banister at every landing. Ouch, 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 ouch. Mama, mommy, mommy. But no one can go with me. I am crying from inside this sack and invent a desperate ploy. You know what? I feel better. I'm not sick anymore. Let me out. I cry in Spanish. They don't. Bagged, I am thrown in the back of the ambulance. Did they have to turn on that siren, that wailing noise? I had never heard a siren before until that time when I was five years old. My heart is popping out of my chest. Maybe I'm dead already. Wrapped in a sheet like a corpse in a shroud? Blind in the bag, racing through the screaming city night to who knows where. The men are laughing and joking to each other in a language I don't understand. But you know what? You don't need to translate indifference. These guys don't care. So what if they got a little five-year-old girl in a sack crying for her mommy? They don't care about me. How can they, but I'm thinking, how can they not care? Everybody has always cared for me. I am la niña, Rosita Dolores. My mommy calls me cookie, monkey, nanny and covers me with kisses. Mi abuelo, Justino, he claps and smiles when I dance for him. Oh, so pretty, so sweet. Everybody loves me. Rosita Dolores, only now here in New York, in the big America, they don't. See, I don't know the rules that contagious people must be removed from tenement apartments. No exceptions. Otherwise, the whole city can be infected with chicken pox. These are the days of epidemics, but I haven't seen, I haven't seen the evidence yet. The kids with withered polio legs, braces, scars from chicken pox. See, you never see some kids. The ones with the fever melted brains who have to be taken care of till they are old people still in diapers. I haven't heard about Sister Kenny yet and how she invented physical therapy for withered polio legs. I don't know about iron lungs or the many diseases that can spread so fast and kill everybody. I want to go back to my one lousy room, even just to die from chicken pox. 
on my bed bug, chinchas, infected mattress with my mommy, who will kiss me and scream that she wants to die with me. That would be better. Or maybe, if I can't do that, maybe it's better to escape from this, like, like the little bird that died right in my hand. Escape to heaven and know no more pain, no more crazy itching, and get away from these guys who are laughing and joking over my body in the ambulance. So there I am at age five. I'm already up to to be or not to be. And that is the question that I don't answer for almost 30 years. And even then, I get the wrong answer. You'll see. Burning hot, 103 degree temperature, I itch like crazy. But I'm still alive when they unbag me. And I look around their miserable misericordia ward with the, all of the other dead looking bodies or the ones like me, all the moaning, infectious, diseased people, and my one Spanish-speaking little boy, hey boy. Hey boy, shut up. Shut up, boy. And there, in one instant, in a bed of the infectious disease ward, are the themes of my life. Scared to death, fighting to survive, forever a foreigner in more ways than you can possibly imagine. Right then, at age five, right there in the hospital ward, I get it. I'm on my own. Estoy sola. But wait a minute. How am I supposed to take care of myself? This is me, the shivery little Puerto Rican girl feeling lost in the world. Make like I'm tough. Maybe, hey boy, is my first line as a make-believe spitfire. Hey boy! <laughs> At that moment, I get that role right. I've got to pretend to be somebody I am not. Inside, I am shaking so hard. Is it fever or is it fear? Do the symptoms fit the feelings that are already there? Is that when she, that dark presence that hisses only doubt and fear in my ear, first attacked me? Ha <laughs> ha, you won't fool anybody. This little voice whispers in my ear. Who do you think you are? Well, I just don't let my feelings show. I pretend to be someone that I'm not. This idea lasts through my whole life. I always play a part for so many years. I have to be a smoldering, sexy spitfire. Rita Moreno, funny and bold and golden as all her statuettes. The Hispanic heroine with all four gleaming prizes, Oscar, Tony, Emmy, Grammy, big money, hot lovers, perfect, perfect, 45-year marriage with a gold medal hanging around my neck and shelves filled with award statuettes, but still inside, thinking, who is she? Who am I? Rosita Dolores Alverio or Rita Moreno? Rita or Rosita, who am I? Well, this book is my real story, the record of my journey, the story of how I found myself, the story of who I am. <laughs> uh, I, I thought I had marked this space in Spanish, but I have to. What? I am. I'm in. Oh, it's marked. Estúpida, bruta. Bueno, no estúpida, pero bruta. So I'm just going to read a little tiny section in Spanish because I know it's hard for <coughs> Americanos because, see, all of us understand English. All of us. Nosotros. But uh, the. American people don't. So let me just read a little bit of Spanish from the book. Um, okay. It's about Christmas in Puerto Rico and how I remember it. Okay? La temporada de Navidad en Puerto Rico es diferente 
a la del resto del mundo y definitivamente muy diferente a las festividades de Navidad en la América continental. En Juncos, mi pueblo, la, la Navidad parece durar la mitad del año, pero no por los tres días oficiales de Navidad, sino por el tiempo que se toman los preparativos para esos trece di, tres días oficiales. Todo Puerto Rico re, se recocijaba por lo ocurrido tanto tiempo atrás, al otro lado, lado del mundo, en Belén. Teníamos más pesebres, más niños Jesús, más santos, más burros que ninguna otra natividad en el mundo. Se decora todo el pueblo y hay muchas procesiones. Los santos marchan por todas partes. Sus imágenes pintadas con colores atrevidos y escandalosos que en, el, en cualquier otra parte del mundo serían demasiado. Pero no en Puerto Rico. <risa> Pero en un pueblo donde todo está pintado con colores brillantes, donde hasta el bosque está coloreado por la, natura, la naturaleza en fieros tonos de rojo, rosado fuerte, verde limón, amarillo brillante, los colores de los santos lucen apenas bien. Pintados con una paleta de brillantes colores, los santos llevan exquisitas vestiduras de color azul, turquesa, oro, cadmio, fuchsia, que gritan, ¡Alábenos! Ok, that's, that's what you get in Spanish. ¿No le gusta? ¿Le gusta? Ok, now I'm ready. I'm ready for some questions and I hope you ask them. En español e inglés no me importa. Y entenderán que yo hablo a veces, muchas veces, Spanglish. Y disculpen. Sí, señor, dígame. Yes. You want to stand up so we can all hear you. Oh, good, we have a microphone. You came to start him in the... It's not on. No, no, it's not. It's just for the live stream. You came to start him in the final days of the studio system and the, and the star grooming power. How do you think your career would have been different if you had gone, come to prominence a generation earlier or a generation later? How do you think my career would have been different if I had started earlier or later? Well, earlier would have been a disaster because even when I did it, you know, there was no role model for me. Eso es lo importante. Yo no tenía nada de role model. Nadie, no había nadie latino en el cine americano. So I chose Elizabeth Taylor. I mean, she was beautiful, and she had enormous success, and she, uh, she was a lovely actress, and I thought, well, if that's all I have, that's what I'll take. So, you know, I did my eyebrows in a special way, and I had a waist cincher that was <laughs> and I got a tiny waist, and, and uh, in fact, I was signed to an MGM contract, Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer MGM, because I looked like a Spanish Elizabeth Taylor. So, in a way, uh, It was probably, at that time, the best time to be in films, but at the, really it wasn't. It was terrible for me because I had all of these parts, estos papeles, you know, these, uh, these, these, these roles where I was doing a Conchita Lolita kind of character. <laughs> Junkie pig. <laughs> Why do you not love Lolita no more? <laughs> Or things like, uh, ah, do you think you can fool Conchita? <laughs> <laughs> And you know, as I said earlier, it's funny now. It wasn't so funny then, it was painful. And it was demeaning. And there was a, a certain kind of indignity to those roles. But that's the way they saw us. We were easy, that means we would sleep with anybody. And you know, hopefully we had big bosoms, I didn't, which was a, a real, that was a real uh, uh, loss. So uh, there was a I, ha I wore a lot of Goodyear rubber here. <laughs> One time I turned and hit a wall and I bounced. <laughs> you think I'm kidding, right? <laughs> no. So you ask me what is the difference if I had come later? I think if I had come later, it probably wouldn't have happened at all. Because nobody, you know, th what, what you're seeing right now, this Rita Moreno, 
is the product of 81 years of trying to uh, trying to become a person, a person who is proud of who she is. It took me a very long time. I did not want to be Latina when I was a girl. I did not want to be Puerto Rican. I wanted to be Elizabeth Taylor because I knew that was the, gay, the way to maybe get uh, employment in films. I want to remind you that the reason I was so dead set against being Latina at that time is that when I was five years old, it started when I was five in America, in New York City, people started to call me, people, kids used to call me spick. Well, it was no big deal. Grease ball, garlic mouth, pierced ear. Those were the names I was called. Now, I didn't understand those words at first, but I saw the faces, and I saw the attitudes, and I knew it was a bad thing. And when I finally learned what those words meant, let me say this, that when you're very young, you're very tender, and anything can influence you. And if you are told often enough that you don't have value, that you're, you know, not that interesting, because of what you are, you believe it. It's easy to believe. Children are so tender. And I believed it. I, be I never told my mother that I was called those names, so I didn't have her support because she didn't know that anything was wrong. And, and I didn't want to tell her because I just thought she would be so upset and she'll go down the street and start hollering at kids. And, and I, I didn't want to be further humiliated. So. To answer your question, I think the only time I could have really made a career was about 10 years ago in that Hollywood. It was so filled with prejudice and bias. It was so filled with, with uh, uh, notions. You know, it's like the, um, uh, oh gosh, um, you know, when you're 81, you forget names and stuff. Trayvon Martin, expectations. You know, this man saw a black boy and he immediately figured that something was wrong. So this is what happens with Latinos too. I mean, you don't, thank God, you don't always get shot, but it's, it's, it's one of the things, it's, it's those kind of expectations that uh, defeat, that defeat um, the ability to go on and make something of yourself. So, you know, when you ask, if, if you ask me about Trayvon Martin, that's, that's my feeling. I think this man killed somebody who had no weapons on him. Now, this is not why I came here, and I'm not even going to go any further with this. I'm only making an example of, of how people see other people. That's all I'm saying, really. So uh, I don't think I could have made it until about 10 years ago. But I might have made it in a, in a more, in, a, in, a, in an, more accessible way because then I wouldn't have to speak with an accent all the time and I wouldn't have to do Conchita Lolita, you know, Pepe, that, all that kind of stuff. But um, it's still hard. Ricardo Montalban said something very meaningful a number of years ago. When I talked to him about this situation, the, 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 the Hispanic situation and films and all that, he said something so wise and it still goes, it still has meaning. He said, the door is a jar. O sea, que la puerta no está abierta completamente, pero está un poquito abierta. And it's true. And the reason, I think, that, because uh, I've been asked by many young people, I've spoken to young people in high schools and universities, Latinos and blacks, why hasn't somebody else gotten an Oscar, you know, among the, 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 the Latinos particularly? And I don't think the answer is that mysterious. I think it's because the Latino actors and actresses have not received roles in movies that would earn at least a nomination. ¿Me entienden? Porque no han, no, no le han dado papeles, roles, en esas películas que merecen por lo menos un, un uh, nomination. Eso es lo que pasa. I don't think it's complicated. And that is because there's a mindset there is a mindset that, you know, they look at you and they think of one thing. They think Latino. I, uh, I'm, I was changing agents, agents of people who um, 
give you, um, uh, jo help you get jobs. And we approached one agency to see if they were interested in, in uh, representing me. And you know what one of the men said there, one of the men in charge, he said, well, you know, we have another Latina actress in our, in our roster. And I said, ah. <laughs> and I wanted to say, well, don't you also have a lot of singers? Do you have Patti LuPone and Bernadette Peters? Yeah. I said, so? Do they cancel each other out? I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing that people are still thinking that way. That's, that's just, it made me very angry. Anyway, another question? Um, as a longtime fan, you have inspired me as a triple threat. And I wanted to ask you, what is your favorite role and why? Oh, my favorite role has to be uh, Anita in West Side Story. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, number one, it's a pretty fabulous fo um, um, film. But here's the most important thing that you didn't know maybe about my playing Anita. It's that I found, finally, after all those years, a role model. Anita is strong. Anita has pride. Anita is smart. And she has a sense of dignity. I didn't have that for years and years and years, and she eventually became my role model. And that is, well, you know, that, that's the movie, I think, that did. it changed my life. And I'm, um, I'm so proud to have been a part of it. And you know, it got me not only an Oscar, but a Golden Globe, so. Que viva la boricua! Bueno, esta pregunta es en español. Ok, ¿cómo? Okay. ¿Cómo ah, vamos, no? vamos adelante. En abril de 1962, me parece que fue, fue abril 9, que usted se ganó el Oscar. Sí. Eh, ¿Nos podría llevarnos a esa noche y decirnos qué fue lo que sintió cuando usted estuvo en el estrado y recibió esa estatuilla que otros latinos, tal vez hasta muy, muy reciente, con Bardem y con Penélope Cruz, han, han ganado? ¿Pero qué fue lo que usted sintió? en ese momento cuando Anita triunfó ante los ojos del mundo? Buena pregunta. Es que... Oh, yeah, he, he wants to know, he wants to know what, what were my feelings when I won the Oscar, because... How, were you keep it? how what? And where do you keep it? And where I keep it? <laughs> in front of everybody in my living room. <laughs> Uh, well, I guess I should answer. Bueno, como ustedes hablan inglés también, por favor, disculpen, ¿ok? ¿Está bien? Eh, porque ya saben que yo puedo hablar español, right? Ok, ok. Uh, so I'm going to do it in English. Uh, I was uh, stunned. I really thought that Judy Garland would win. She was up for an Oscar that year. And, um, and she was, it was for a film called Judgment at Nuremberg, a great film. At, by, oh, yeah. Big competition. I thought, yo me chave. <laughs> se, se jodió la cosa entera. I can do that in Spanish. <laughs> he can't see me. Move away. Está bien. Porque no ve ella, ¿verdad? Y aquí ve mi culito. You didn't know I'm like this, did you? Una mujer muy sucia. <laughs> where was I? Oh, I just fell in love with myself and I forgot where I was. Oh, the, the Oscar, right. So, you know, I remember when my name was called. Oh, I'm going to tell you a great story about Oscar Died after this. Um, when my name was called, I got up absolutely amazed. I really was, I had no idea. I was there just in case. Por si las moscas, right? And when they called my name, I got out of my seat. And I remember saying to myself, don't run to, to the stage. It's not dignified. Y eres una Latina, no corra. No corre, no corre. Anda con dignidad. And the reason most actresses run is because they don't want the applause to stop, and then they have to go all the way up to the stage with no applause. And I thought, I don't care. 
the hell with them if the applause stops, but it didn't. I mean, West Side Story was a big, big winner. Everyone loved that movie that year. So I got up there and I, I made a really wondrous speech. I said, I can't believe it. <laughs> I leave you with that. It's one for the history books, isn't it? But let me tell you this amazing story. This made me cry. I had a friend named uh, Liz Torres. She was a comedian, a Puerto Rican comedian. Yes, she was wonderful. And she was a dear friend. And she said, you know, when you got your Oscar, I lived in El Barrio in New York City. And she said, you know very well as a Latina that El Barrio is a very noisy place. I mean, none of us talks, you know, at a, at a decent level. It's like, I get up! Okay, me too. I'm no different. You, I laugh crowd, I laugh loud, I cry loud. This is me. This is Puerto Rico. I'm sorry. So she said to me, you know, normally the barrio is a very noisy place. She said, that night it was very hot. All the windows were open. And everybody in El Barrio had the television sets on. It was Oscar night. She says, they were all talking and laughing and drinking and having fun. And she said, the moment that the actor Rock Hudson came up to give out the names of the nominees, she said it turned absolutely dead silent. And then he read the names, and the last name was mine, and then he said, and the winner is Rita Moreno. Well, the place erupted in smoke. <laughs> they started yelling out the window, se la comió, coño! <laughs> My God, she did it, she did it, she did it. I mean, they were screaming out the windows at each other. And when she told me that, I started to cry because somebody said to me later when I told them this story, what they were really saying, my friend said, is we did it. We did it. Is that wonderful? Do you want to say something? Hi, Rita. Hi. I can't see you, but my wife tells me you're as beautiful as ever. She's right. <laughs> I'm as beautiful as ever. No she, question about it. You, I heard the word spit come up before. And yes. basically, it's a deprivation from the Puerto Rican immigrant who, when they first came over here, when they were asked, and they said, no speak English. That's right. That's where the word That's came exactly from. That's exactly where that came from, no speak English. My Puerto Rican. Did you Rican, know that? You didn't know that. Right. Yes. That's, that's where it comes That's from. just where it came from. The word a mick for the Irish was because of the potato shortage. They were called mickeys in Ireland. The potatoes were called mickeys? Yes. So, oh, so the Irish were called mick. That's where the word mick came from. Right. And the word but that's not so bad, but kike is not so terrific. Well, the word kike. <laughs> that's, that's a terrible, the terrible word, word for kike, Jewish people. The word yeah. kike came from a cross that was put on the Jewish immigrants when they came over here. And the Jewish word for cross is kaikala. Oh my God. I don't know if I should sit down or not. Anyway, don't I know. wanted to tell you, I'm American born, yeah. but my Puerto Rican uh, relationship, when I first met my wife, I asked her to dance and she heard my English and she refused to dance with me. <laughs> True. Why? She had the the mentality that the only ones who could dance Latin were Puerto Ricans and oh, Cubans. Oh, oh, a Jew doing la my, salsa? My coming from I the Bronx. I still don't see that, but never mind. My coming, <laughs> my coming, my coming from the Bronx. Uh, I had a store on 149th Street and Third Avenue in in the heart of Puerto Rico, like Little Havana right. in New York. And a couple of Puerto Rican girls came in, and one day I kept hearing the mambo music, and they asked me if I'd like to learn, and that's how I learned. And they then taught I you? Wound up dancing the next 10 years with Tito Puente at the Palladium. Oh, uh, Tito Puente, mi I amigo. Do, I, I do have, I do have a, a Puerto Rican story. I had a store on 149th Street and 3rd Avenue, and I was there about three weeks, and a couple of Puerto Rican girls came in, and said to me, is there a Marty Cohn here? <laughs> Marty Cohn. I had no... <laughs> I had no idea what they were talking about. 
The following day, they came in again, and they said, are you sure there's no Marty Cohn here? I said, I'm positive. Finally, one of my Puerto Rican sales girls came over to me and said, Mr. Wendro, they're, they're not asking for Martin Cohn. And finally, they told me who Marty Cohn was. And that was my Puerto Rican experience. Well, why experience. were they looking for Marty Cohn there at your place? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, see, that he can't tell me, huh? <laughs> Great story. Yes, Ms. Moreno, I have vicariously have lived through you most of my life, uh, being of Spanish descendant. And Are you? Oh, yeah. My family's from Spain and being with the DNA of the fire and the dance and the singing and all. But I wanted to, your mother, if your mother was not so ambitious and did not do what she did, possibly we would not know about Rita Moreno. Or would you have found your own way in a different way? What do you, know, you think? I probably, that's a good question. I probably would have found my own way anyway because my mom wasn't ambitious in that sense. She just understood. I mean, I used to dance for Grandpa in Puerto Rico, you know, shaking my little booty to some salsa record. And uh, it wasn't she who started me on my career. It was a friend of hers, Irene Lopez, Irene Lopez, who uh, uh, was a Spanish dancer. And Irene saw me bopping around the apartment one time, yeah. And she said, you know, I think Rosita has a, might have a future as a dancer. So she asked my mom, she said, can I take her to my dancing teacher? You'll read all this in the book, Paco Cancino. And uh, that's how it all started. It wasn't my mommy. But more than that, my mommy was never Mama Rose, like in Gypsy. She really never was. But she knew that I needed to do this. I mean, it's like in my... DNA, it's in my bones, it's in the marrow of my bones. This is what I was meant to do from the time I was, you know, a tiny little girl. It's just so much a part of me. I'm one of the very few show, show business people I know who's never done any other work. Any, I've never been a secretary, I've never been an x-ray technician, I've never been a receptionist, I've never been a waitress, because uh, I was doing my job as a professional dancer from the time I was like 16. And it, I, I was able to make a living at it. I did nightclubs, I was underage. I mean, the, the, uh, the owners of the nightclubs used to hide me with a big fur coat at the end of the room when they saw some of the cops come in because I was underage. And they would put a drink in front of me, which was always, of course, a Coke. But, uh, oh, it's absolutely, it's so much a part of me. So when some young person says to me now, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life, I think, really? And uh, it's not fair of me, but I always knew what I wanted to do. Yo sabía, pero del momento que nací, que me parieron. Anyone? Yes, yes, sir? Allá atrás? Yeah, you. I grew up with you in a lecture company, and Did I love you, you there. Ah! And, uh, did you did you learn to read from that? I uh, learned to read in Sesame Street, so I'm not going to admit to something now. But I loved you because you were Hispanic, and in those days, my family lived in Boston, and there weren't a lot of Hispanic people around us. So for me, you were like I don't know something I, I always looked up to. But how did you get involved with that program? The electric company. Yeah. How did I get involved with the electric company? You know, they just said uh, this was after the Oscar and all those awards. And uh, the, Ses the Sesame Street people who also were going to do a reading show called The Electric Company, they called my agent and said, we'd love to have her because we want to have a diverse cast. I mean, you may not remember, but it had Morgan Freeman in it, and it had Bill Cosby. Pretty good. It also had, nobody remembers this, Irene Cara. Yeah. You remember Irene? Because she didn't have a lot to do there. but. Uh, and I, I loved the idea because at the time my daughter was then about uh, Fernanda Luisa, se llama. Uh, about that time, Fernanda was watching uh, Sesame Street. And she was uh, a reluctant reader. And when, uh, when my show went on the air, she really loved it. And it just, it just teased her into learning to read. And of course, to this day, she's an avid reader, which is terrific. But... Uh, Hey, you guys. I don't want to blow out the. Hey, you guys! Oh, 
It's nothing. <laughs> no, ¿qué, qué, 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 ¿Qué me quieren preguntar aquí? Okay. The Ritz. With depression, it always makes me laugh. We laugh I got you out of depression with that? Because you make me laugh. All right. But do you feel that it was demeaning or do you, I mean, first of all, we need do to Do I feel that the character I was playing was demeaning? You were so wonderful with it. And I saw you on Johnny Carson explaining your character one night. You did? Yes. <laughs> I'm old. And then, <laughs> but it was that how you came up with it from a cocktail party. And do you think that it would be too much demeaning now, but we're supposed to laugh at ourselves? Not at all, and I'll tell you why. I, for those of you, did anyone see the Ritz here? Yes. Not too many people, okay. Uh, Googie Gomez was an invention of mine. Uh, she came out of me one day when I belched. <laughs> and uh, we, you know, when dancers have 10 minute breaks, they do one thing, two things. They light up a cigarette, even now, knowing what they know. And then you do funny things to break each other up. So when I was doing the film, out came this character one night. I, I got up and I said, okay, this is a Puerto Rican girl who cannot sing or dance and is auditioning for a bus and truck uh, company of gypsy. Yipsy. <laughs> and I got up and I did this, which ended up in the play and in the movie. I had a drink. <laughs> Because it's all about attitude. A drink about Jew, baby. <laughs> it's gonna come through, baby. They seen that we're through, but, baby. And then I would go, thing looks swell, thing look great. Gonna have a whole grill on a plate. It's starting here, it's starting now. Only everything coming out rasas. <laughs> and she really was funny. She still makes me laugh. She still makes me laugh. Here's the interesting thing. One person, and all the time I was doing this on Broadway, and I got, I got a Tony Award for that. Um, the, there was one person who said, shame on her, you know, making fun of Puerto Ricans. And I thought, no, I'm making fun of people I've seen who have absolutely no talent, and yet think they are the, the gift of the gods. Because that's what's funny about, what's funny about Gugi Gomez is that she thinks she's brilliant. She, she doesn't hear herself when she's singing, I had a drink. <laughs> a drink about you, baby. And she has no idea. She thinks she's fabulous. And I love playing characters like that who have no idea. They're arrogant. They're arrogant. They have no idea how really horrendous they are. I loved it. And so did the audiences. It was marvelous. Thank you for asking that. Okay, yeah? experience like making West Side Story and do you keep in touch with any of your castmates still? I am in touch with my castmates all the time. George Shakiris is my daughter's uh, godfather. He's a dear, dear friend. He's a wonderful person. And uh, every once in a while when I'm in LA long enough, we all get together and have a party and we're the same. It's, we, it's like we never grew up. I call them the kids. These kids have no hair on top, the guys. <laughs> They have big bellies. They have culo grandote. <laughs> but to me, they're the kids. And uh, we're very dear friends. We really formed a, a very profound bond in West Side Story. Y aunque George Shakir is Puerto Rican, he's still my dear friend. He's a good guy. He's a very good guy. What's happened? Russ Tamblin. Russ Tamblin. Him too. I just saw him uh, a couple of months ago. We're very good friends. Yes. Who's, who has a, a Puerto Rican fabulous daughter-in-law and one and she has made a concerted effort to make this child who's eight now very proud of being Puerto Rican one day I was babysitting her and she was eating a lot of chocolate and I said to her Alexandra it's enough and she turned to me and she said grandma do you know who I am <laughs> she said don't you know Puerto Ricans love chocolate? <laughs> <laughs> I must remember that. <laughs> Hi, you cute thing. I've been looking at these young girls here. I have a question in reference to your earlier story about how you said you recalled so many derogatory terms and names as a young girl. Yeah. How did that 
make you feel since you were under so much more scrutiny on Broadway at the young age of 13? Did you feel you needed to prove yourself more? Did you feel you needed to live up to something or were you pretty much the same? You are so articulate. How old are you? 14. I'm sorry, what? 14. 14. And your name is? Amari. Amari? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, well, we're, we're, you're tying two things together that don't belong together. When I was being called all those terrible names was when I was much younger. By the time I got to uh, Broadway, and don't, let me remind you that theater is much more enlightened. You know, a lot of people can do a lot of very different roles in theater. I have played an Irish school teacher, Irish, you know, in a play called uh, The Miracle Worker. And uh, I, I, I played Southern Bells. I did the Steel Magnolias with my daughter, in fact, who's also Latina. But we played these Southern women. So how did it make me feel? It made me want not to be Latina at that time. And I think that's, there's a lot of that in this book because I think it's so important to talk about that and how I made the journey and, and uh, had a, uh, an, an epiphany and realized one day that it was not only okay to be Latina or to be someone who was not white, who was not um, uh, American, but that I could bring in my field riches from my culture to this country. And that's what I think uh, Latinos have done in this country. And I think people are scared of us because we are so free with our culture. We love to laugh, we love to drink, we love to dance, we love to be happy. And I think that scares a lot of very uptight white people. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So we have to help them not to be afraid of us. We have to help them. There's a wonderful series that I'm a part of on public television, which is, oh, uh, when is, does it go on the air, John? The 17th? Of, 17th of September, uh, Latinas in America. It's called Latinas, Latinos in America, and it's a documentary, actually, and it takes in a lot of people, just simple people, you know, someone like you, someone like you, and it tells the story of, it chronicles the story of how we got here, how it happened, not just Puerto Ricanos, but all Latinos in this country. It's an amazing uh it's the, uh, you'll see it, but it's on public television. It'll, I think it starts. It's an eight-hour miniseries. Six-hour. Six, but it's, it's, it's a major, it's the first of its kind ever. Uh, it's like a Ken Burns has done many of those things. What is this? PBS. PBS, public television. Yeah. All your public yeah. television stations. I am a part of it mm -hmm. because they figured that I should be a part of it, but there are just simple people. And then there's not simple people, there are scientists, there are professors, there are attorneys, all kinds of people, and it tells an amazing story. By the way, here's something I learned. Did you know, I know you didn't, I know you didn't. <laughs> Did you know that the first European language spoken in America, North America? Spanish. Spanish. Yes. And what? Say it again. In San Agustin, the first baby, the first baby boy born in the United States was Spanish. Espanol. Espanol. Amazing. And it's not amazing. It's just that, you know, nobody knows these things. But I, I do hope you'll tune in because this is an amazing show. You want to see it. Okay. Gloria Stefan is in it, too. I mean, there's a lot of wonderful people in it. from growing up. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I loved you for that. And also, did you realize at the time that you were doing it that you were being introduced to a whole new generation? Because I can remember my Cuban mother telling me, Esa Moreno, ella es Anita, la West Side Story, and learning who you were. And that stays with people for the, for the rest of Boy, their lives. Boy, it sure does, because <laughs> I keep hearing it from younger people. That makes me so happy. Porque yo creía siempre que eran los ancianos. I thought it was always people my age, but now I find more and more there are a lot of young women and young men who not only know me but are impressed because of their, what their parents have told them. I, I, that's, that's amazing. I mean, piensa que yo soy todavía aquí adentro 
vive Rosita Dolores. Y ella vive en mí until the day I die. She will be there forever. So, say in such great shape. Great shape. Yeah. Well, yeah. I starved myself for months at a time. No, 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 no. You know, I just have good DNA. De vera. De vera, tengo un cutis bueno para una viejita como yo. 81, mija. So. I think it's time to sign some books. Okay. And a huge round of applause. En el otro lado. Yes, we're going to go to the other side of the room. We want to thank you. We have her books in English and in Spanish. Thank you.